say that again right now. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the final virtual uh, Wells College Visiting Writers Series event of the fall 2020 semester. I'm Dan Rosenberg. Hi, Joanne. Um, I'm the director of the series, and as always, I want to make sure to begin by thanking um, one of the um, one of the groups that make the Visiting Writers Series possible, which is NISCA, the New York State Council for the Arts, um, which has generously supported our series for many years. Um, tonight's reading um, with Sarah Pinsker, um, you're all going to be muted as you are now, but there is a chat option in Zoom, and I would invite you to type any questions or comments you have into the chat, and there will be a, a break sort of in the, in the middle of Sarah's reading where we can pause and, and pose those questions to her and have a little conversation so it's a bit more interactive than just like a thing where you're watching you're watching Sarah monologue for the whole time so that would be nice um, and we can do that and there'll also be time at the end for a more formal Q&A and if you would like to voice your own questions at that time you can use the raise hand feature of Zoom and I will unmute you and you can ask your question in your own voice if you'd like um, so if that makes sense and that is it for logistics, and I um, we're going to turn to a quick introduction to Sarah Pinsker, but it's not going to be me. Um, Bob Prohl has asked for the honor of introducing Sarah to you all. Um, Bob has been an invaluable member of the English department this semester, and he's helped organize this visiting writer series in ways that have made my life both better and easier. So thank you, Bob, very much, and I am very happy to turn it over to you now. All right. Thanks, Dan. Am I? All right. Good. Um, thank you. I'm very excited uh, to be introducing Sarah. Um, Sarah will be reading from her Nebula winning uh, novel, A Song from a New, for a New Day. Um, this is a book that is, it, it's an odd book to encounter uh, in 2020. It's an odd book uh, for me to revisit uh, in 2020. Um, and I think there may be questions about how prophetic this book uh, is or manages to be, but um, to me, I, I'm not that interested right now in talking about Sarah as a, as a prophet as I am in talking about her as a, as a writer. Um, I think in a lot of ways, Sarah's writing uh, harkens back to a sort of golden age of, of sci-fi, um, but uh, breaking it out of the, the sort of hard shell of white cishet authors. Uh, in that a lot of her stories and, and novels are about uh, positing a technology and exploring the, uh, the personal and the emotional sides of that. And um, I think with A Song for a New Day, she does a, a really fascinating and amazing sleight of hand in that we're looking at the technology that, that Sarah puts in front of us, we're looking at the hoodie and the, this sort of immersive interactive uh, garment that people are using in this, uh, this moment where, the, where um, we're not allowed to be in shared space uh, and the ways that people are, are connecting a sort of um, immersive internet type experience. And we're looking at the, the stage hollow uh, recording rig and we're looking at this beautiful bespoke amp that at, at one point Luce gets to use. And we're seeing these technologies that are not useless, but are, are ultimately insufficient. And the sleight of hand is that Sarah is also showing us the, the technology that we've always had that is both necessary and sufficient. Uh, it's, it's the crowded room. It's the press of a stranger's shoulder against another stranger's shoulder. It's the, the moment when the lights go up and the crowd sort of irrationally erupts in applause for the thing that's about to come. The technology is the thing that's about to come. The, the technology is the moment and the community and the song. And it's something that's been with us the entire time. Um, this is a book I, uh, I deeply, deeply love. And I'm, I'm very excited that uh, Sarah's going to be sharing it with all of you. Ladies and gentlemen, Sarah Pinsker. Hey there. So I'm going to read to you uh, from two sections and well, like a uh, as, oh, I'm big all of a sudden. Um, as was said a second ago, I'll, I'll do a section, then we'll talk a little, and then I'll, I'll do another. Um, and I'm also going to skip the sort of weirdly prophetic parts. Um, the, the last reading I did last March, I, I read that stuff, and it, it, it's a little eerie still. So I'm, I'm going to skip that um, and start you with the beginning. 
There were, to my knowledge, 172 ways to wreck a hotel room. We had brainstormed them all in the van over the last eight months on the road. As a game, I'd thought, 61, turn all the furniture upside down, 83, release a pack of feral cats, 92, fill all the drawers with beer, or 93, marbles, 114, line the floor with soapy plastic and turn it into a slip and slide, etc., etc. In my absence, my band had come up with the 173rd and had for the first time added in a test run. I was not proud. What would Gemma do if she were here? I stepped all the way into their room instead of gawking from the hallway and closed the door before any hotel employees could walk past, pressing the button to illuminate the do not disturb sign for good measure. Damn it, guys, this is a nice hotel. What the hell did you do? We found some paint. Hewitt's breath smelled like a distillery's dumpster. He lingered beside me in the vestibule. You're a master of understatement. All their bags and instruments were crammed into the closet by the entrance. The room itself was painted a garish neon pink, which it definitely hadn't been when I'd left that morning. Not only the walls either, the headboard, the nightstand, the dresser. The spatter on the carpet suggested somebody had knifed a Muppet and let it crawl away to die. For all the paint, Hewitt's breath was still the overwhelming odor. Even the TV, I asked, really? The television, frame and screen, cable news blared behind a drippy film of pink, discussing the new highway only for self-driving cars. We'd be avoiding that one. JD lounged on the far bed, holding a glass of something caramel colored. His shoes were pink. The bedspread, the sight of another Muppet murder. We considered doing an accent wall. He waved his glass at the wall behind the headboard. April sat on the desk, sticks in hand, drumming a soundless tattoo in the air. How was your day, she asked, as if nothing was wrong. Excuse me for a second. I ducked into the hall and fumbled for the key card to the room I shared with April. Our room was quiet and empty and, most importantly, not pink. I leaned my guitar bag in a corner and let out a breath I hadn't known I was holding, then lay back on the bed and dialed Gemma. We're not supposed to be out here alone, I said when she picked up. When are you coming back? She sighed. Hi, Luce. My brother is fine. Thanks for asking. The bullet went straight through him without hitting any organs. I heard. I'm glad he's okay. I'm sorry. I should have asked first. But do you think you're coming home soon? No, I really don't. What's the matter? Do you need something? A tour manager. A babysitter for these giant children you ditched me with so I can concentrate on music instead of being the adult in the room when I'm younger than all of them. Never mind. I shouldn't have called. I'm sorry I bothered you. I hope your brother gets well soon. I disconnected. We should have been able to handle a few weeks on the road without a tour manager. Lots of bands did fine with that one, but those were probably real bands where everybody had a vested interest. I'd played solo until the label hired these so-called professionals to back me on tour. He would let me in again when I knocked. Inside the fridge, two large bottles had been cram crammed in sideways, gin and tequila. The painted mini fridge left my fingertips pink and tacky. My prints made me complicit, I supposed. I pulled out the tequila and took a long slug straight from the bottle. Cheap, astringent stuff. No wonder they were chilling it. The armchair under the window was paint-free, so I made my way to it with the tequila, trying not to touch anything else. Well, April, I began answering her questions if I hadn't left. Since you asked, my day started at five this morning with stops at two different TV morning shows. Then I did a radio call-in show. Then I spent two hours on the phone in a station parking lot arguing with the label about why we still don't have our new t-shirts. Then I did a couple of acoustic songs for a local music podcast, ate a highly mediocre burrito, and came back here to find you've been far more productive than me. I mean, why did I waste all that time promoting our show tomorrow night when I could have been helping you redecorate? They were all glare resistant. Not even April had the decency to look uneasy. They knew I had the power to fire them if I wanted, but I wouldn't. We got along too well on stage. It wasn't in me to maintain stern disinterest. So where did you get the paint? April grinned. We looked up where the nearest liquor store was, right? We had to run across the highway to get there and there were like six lanes and it was a little uh, harrowing. So on the, way, on the way back, we tried to find a better place to cross. Like maybe there was a crosswalk somewhere and then we passed a super Wally daycare that had a room being redone and it was completely deserted, right? But the door was open, I guess to air it out. A groan escaped me and I took another chug of tequila. You stole it from a daycare? 
a super Wally daycare, said JD. They won't be going broke on our account, I promise you. Anyway, we also went back out again to the actual Super Wally and spent some money there that we wouldn't have spent otherwise, so it cancels out. I was almost afraid to ask, what else did you buy? That's the best part. Hugh would flip the light switch. The room lit up. The pink television and the wall behind the headboard had been painted over with an alien green glow-in-the-dark wash only visible with the lights off. On the wall backing the bathroom, our band logo, a sparking cannon. April's drumsticks glowed too. If only they'd stuck to painting things they owned. I hope one of you pulled a Cheshire cat because I need somebody to punch in the teeth. JD's voice came from beside me. Like I said, we considered an accent wall, but then we decided against it. I put the bottle to my mouth to keep myself from saying something I'd regret later. Dozed off for a second in the chair, then started awake when the lights came back on. April had disappeared, probably back to our room. JD was asleep on his bed. Hewitt was singing to himself in the bathroom. I might have rested my eyes for longer than I thought. The tequila walloped me as I lurched to my feet. I tried to channel Gemma, our absent tour manager. She'd gone home three weeks before, after her brother was shot eating lunch at a mall. The label hadn't wanted us to keep touring without her. But I had promised we'd be fine. I shouldn't have called her earlier. This wasn't her fault. Anyway, even if she'd been here today, she'd have been driving with me, managing the promotional appearances, so I could play the pure artist. The band would still have been left to their devices, though they'd probably have thought twice about pulling a stunt like this with her around to ream them out. What would she say? I channeled her to mutter, if and when the hotel bills us for damages, it's coming out of your salaries. You shouldn't need a babysitter when I leave you alone for one single day. I'm supposed to be the artist here. If anybody's entitled to pull this, it's me. You're supposed to be the professionals, damn it. Neither of them responded, if they even heard. That was as far as I needed to take playing grown up. It was the label's fault they hadn't sent a new tour manager, and the label's fault the band got stuck at a suburban hotel all day while I left with the van to do promotional work solo. My jealousy that they kept bonding and I kept getting left out was best tamped down. I took their tequila with me and went next door. April lay on the far bed, her back to me, though I had a feeling she was pretending to sleep. The bed looked tempting, but my face broke out if I didn't scrub off my makeup, and I reeked of the podcaster's unfiltered cigarettes. I kicked my smoky clothes to the corner and stepped into the shower, closed my eyes and let the water hit me, shampooed my hair, eyes still closed. I didn't immediately recognize the next sound, like a school bell, except it kept on signaling. My hazy brain took more than a few seconds to declare it a fire alarm. Shit, April said, loud enough for me to hear over the shower. What is that? I shut off the water and regretfully pulled my smoky clothes back onto my wet self. Ditched the underwear, stuffed the bra under my arm, shoved my feet into my boots without socks. Fire alarm. Though if those yahoos in the room next door turn out to be the cause, we're leaving them here and moving on as a duo. My backpack still lay at the foot of the bed. Wallet, phone, van keys, laptop, tour Bible were all in there. I dropped the smoky bra into it, then slung backpack and guitar bag over my right shoulder. If we were talking real fire, those were the possessions I meant to keep. April trailed me down the hallway, where a flashing light joined the clanging bell. We, we ran into the guys in the stairwell. JD was naked except for his boxer shorts, gig bag, and tattoos. Hewitt wore the hotel bathrobe, covered in paint. He hadn't grabbed his guitar. One look told me neither of them had pulled the alarm. Other people joined us on the stairs, hurried but not panicked. They gave the guys a wide berth. The stairs spilled us out into a side parking lot. A crowd already milled on the asphalt watching the building. A few people sat in their cars, a better idea. A gust of cold wind hit me as I hit the pavement, plastering my wet clothes to my body. Get in the van, GD said. Can't let our singer get sick running around with soapy hair, says the bassist in boxers. He shrugged, though goosebumps had risen on his arms and legs. He, April, and I walked past the crowd to where he, I had parked the van in the brightest spot available when I got back an hour ago. Had it only been an hour ago? I fumbled for the keys in my bag and we piled in. Where'd Hewitt go, I asked, turning on the van and cranking the heat. My suitcase was still in the room, along with any warm clothes I had with me. He hung back to figure out what was going on, JD said. So it wasn't you guys? Ha ha, you think we'd pull a stunt like that? You do remember that an hour ago you were showing me a DIY hotel paint job, right? That's different. It didn't hurt anybody. I'd never. I could have pointed out that they'd cause problems for whoever was responsible for cleaning their room after we checked out. 
or that they might hurt my relationship with the label. But I knew what he meant. Leave these guys too long and they'd get into some stupid human tricks. But they wouldn't have risked panicking sleeping kids. They wouldn't have wanted somebody tripping and falling down the stairs because of a prank, I was pretty sure. I'd only been playing with them for eight months now, but I thought I knew them at least that well. The back door slid open and Hewitt climbed into the third row. It's not a fire. Bomb threat. J.D. frowned. Maybe we should get out of here. We can't go, I said, giving him a look. Most of our stuff is still upstairs. Besides, if it's a bomb threat, it'll look bad for us to leave, considering everyone in that stairwell was already giving you guys the side eye. J.D. wasn't calmed. Shouldn't they be moving people farther away from the building if they think there's a bomb? Or going through it with robots or dogs or something? Hewitt nodded. They're waiting for a bomb team. Are bomb sniffing dogs a thing? April asked. I thought they were just for drugs. They're definitely bomb sniffing dogs, said J.D. Also bomb sniffing bees and bomb sniffing rats, but I think those are used in combat zones, not hotels. A thought nagged at me. Wait, where are the fire trucks or the police? I thought I heard sirens, but they aren't here. Hewitt shrugged. Busy night, I guess. We watched for a while. I guess the people still standing in the parking lot hadn't thought to bring their keys out. A few parents juggled children from hip to hip. I leaned my head against the window and closed my eyes. The others did the same, except J.D. He sat tapping a foot against the frame, hard enough to make the whole van shake. Will you stop? April tossed an empty soda can at him. Try to get some sleep. That wasn't going to happen. I nudged him. Grab your base. He co cocked an eyebrow at me. What? Your base. Come on. I climbed into the back seat and returned a moment later with my little practice amp, the one I'd bought with babysitting money when I was 15, along with my crappy first guitar. It wasn't the best sounding amp, but it would do for this purpose. About 50 cold, scared looking people stood lo still stood in the parking lot, the ones who hadn't grabbed their keys or wallets, who couldn't escape to their cars. If they were stuck, the least we could do was distract them for a little while. J.D. found an outlet in the cement island by the parking lot's gate, and we both jacked our guitars. A couple of people reoriented themselves to watch us instead of the hotel. What are we playing, J.D. asked. You pick, I said. Something cheerful. Something that'll work even if they can't hear the vocals. Almost home, maybe? He didn't answer, but instead started playing the opening bass line. I followed with my guitar part, and then started to sing as loud as I could without straining my voice. I hadn't noticed April following us, but when the second verse started, a scratchy beat locked in with J.D., and I glanced behind me to see she was playing a pizza box. The parents brought their kids over. I imagined them grateful for any diversion at that point, and then others followed. The hotel must have appreciated the distraction, too, since they didn't stop us. The police might have taken issue with the 2 a.m. concert, but they still hadn't arrived. We had the crowd now. When we played Blood and Diamonds, a teenager said, Mom, they're from Superstream. They're famous. My surge of pride accompanying that statement had gotten more familiar, but I still wasn't used to it. I'd never expected anyone to know my songs. Hewitt had discarded the bathrobe somewhere. I made a mental note to make sure he found it again so we didn't get stuck paying for it, then remembered it was covered in paint, so we probably owned it now in any case. He danced in front of us wearing a kilt and a band sweatshirt. At least that way the crowd knew who was playing for them. If I were a better shill, if I didn't feel self-conscious doing it, I would have told them about our show the next night at the Peach. We played eight songs before a haggard-looking hotel manager made his way to us. His upside-down name tag read Ephraim Dawkins, and his hair was flat on one side. I wondered where he'd been sleeping. I'm sorry, he said. It's okay. Not a problem. We'll stop. I raised a hand in appeasement. No, it's not that. I mean, you probably should stop, but not because there's any problem with the music. I appreciate that you've kept people entertained, but the police aren't coming, not before morning. I laid my hand across my guitar string. False alarm? We can go back in? Well, you see, we can't let people back in after a bomb threat without the police clearing the hotel, but the police aren't coming, so we can't let anyone back in at all. The manager massaged the back of his neck with his hand. Company policy. A woman who'd been dancing with her kid a moment before turned on the guy. Wait, so you won't let us go back to our rooms to sleep or to get our keys? What are we supposed to do? Dawkins shook his head. I don't know. I'm just telling you what the police said. Fine, then you're going to give us a ride to another hotel from your chain and put us up there, right? I'd love to, but he paused, glancing around like he hoped someone might bail him out and finish his sentence. Nobody came to his rescue. I'd love to, but every single hotel in the area received the same threat. Every hotel in the chain? No, every hotel. Surely not all the threats are credible. 
Dawkins shrugged. The police seem to think they're all credible, or they can't tell which are credible and which aren't. I looked at all the exhausted faces. A minute before, they'd been dancing and cheering. Now they looked like 2 a.m. again. This is ridiculous, said a man in saggy white briefs, clutching an attache case in front of him. I wouldn't travel anymore at all if I didn't have to. In the last month, I've been through three airport evacuations and one shelter in place at a restaurant. An elderly woman spoke. We must be reasonably safe or they'd have somebody here, a squad car, a fire chief, a dog, somebody. They must have some kind of triage going to prioritize. Dawkins shrugged again. Okay, look, I tried. What about mitigating the risk, letting one person in at a time to get their keys and wallets? I'd love to, but what if there is a bomb? What if it goes off while even one person is in there? Or what if one of you said it? I can't let you do that. Now am I making the best of a crowd from a few minutes before all eyed each other like there was a killer in our midst? A little boy started crying. Look, said a father with a sleeping toddler draped over his shoulder. We need some place to go. April stood up from the curb. Um, I have an idea, a place, you know? She wasn't much for public speaking. When the hotel guests all turned her way, she raised her pizza box as a shield. There's an unlocked Super Wally daycare down the road, she pointed. They were repainting the playroom in the front, but the paint was low odor, and there's a whole napping room in the back with mats. You have to cross the road, but there aren't too many cars out anymore, right? It's walkable. April and Hewitt led the group over, while Dawkins made phone calls to the local police to make sure nobody got arrested for trespassing. That left JD and me standing in an empty hotel parking lot. He sighed. Want to play a little more? Might as well. Thanks, Sarah. Um, if you guys have questions and want to put them in the chat, um, that would be great. Um, we're taking a little break for questions now, uh, and we'll take another one at the end. Um, Sarah, I had sort of an inside baseball question that uh, that came up um, while I was reading this, while I was rereading this for, for our class tomorrow. Um, so I don't know if people know this, but um, when, you're, when you're publishing a novel, um, it's really expensive to get the rights to lyrics. And I didn't, uh, I didn't know that until I tried to put like, epigraphs in a book. And my, my editor was like, well, you can do that, but you would have to, on your own, pay thousands and thousands of dollars. Um, I was wondering if there were any uh, like lines from songs that you really wanted to th that if if money had been no object you would have you would have put in the book. Actually, no. I uh, I had more fun hiding songs in the book. Um, so there there's lots of songs referenced, um, in, including the uh, most the the chapter titles actually make up a, a playlist. Um, some of which is real songs and some of which is Luce's songs um, from the book. So, so they're not all songs that you can actually listen to, um, but there's a whole bunch of other songs hidden here and there in, in references. And I tend to not put lyrics in things because the lyrics sometimes read as doggerel to me uh, when they're placed in a book like, uh, the, you know, the no matter how good your rhyme scheme in a in a song, it, rhyming poetry tends to tends to look a little cheap, and and most songs do have rhymes here and there, and and so I, I tend I tend to steer away from it, and that way that way also people don't critique the lyrics, which isn't necessarily the point, but if they you know people get distracted by lyrics, so so I, I tend to steer away from them. Also, they're expensive. <laughs> yeah, I didn't catch that with the, the uh, chapter titles until germ-free adolescence. And then I was like, oh, wait, this has been happening the whole time. And I just yeah. and then I went back. And, and yeah, it was a whole game I played with myself, too, because the, um, the ones that uh, I tried to make Luce's chapters songs that she would know or that she had written, and then Rosemary's chapters songs that she would know. So her taste changes over time as she's exposed to more stuff. Um, so, so yeah. Um, we have uh, a couple questions. How did you know that this was the scene you wanted to start the novel with? I always knew that was the scene that this started with. Uh, the list, I had that, I had that, um, 
that list in my head forever as as the way I wanted this book to start. Um, it is actually somewhat stolen from something that actually happened to me, which is that I was um, touring with a friend's band and her band did get left for several days um, in a hotel in in the suburbs in Tennessee. Uh, it, like it was just like a you know like a motel on the side of the highway that you could not get to anything except for the liquor store and they they were left there for several days in a row and and they were really nice guys and they didn't want to cause any destruction but they also got really drunk and decided that that like bands are supposed to wreck hotel rooms and so they tried to to do it as politely as possible in a way that would not actually cause anyone trouble, but would make them feel like they had done it. So what they did was they put all of their empties into the dresser, like all the empty beer bottles they put into the dresser drawers, and then they stood the dresser on its side. And they were very proud of themselves. Um, and, and then uh, my friend came back from her little side jaunt and they left again. And what they didn't know was that later on the itinerary they actually were going to end up at that hotel again <laughs> and so the hotel put them back in the same room with the dresser still on end so um yeah i think that that addresses mary's question which is is this based on a true story uh, uh, little things are the i mean a lot of the music stuff is stolen from my own experience um less of the other stuff Uh, Joanne would like to know, is this still set to become a TV series and how do you feel about people binge watching your novel? <laughs> um, I, I tend to think of TV, TV and movie versions as cover versions. So people are, are uh, welcome to do anything they'd like with it. Um, I am going to try to divorce it in my head from the book, not because I don't have any confidence in it. Uh, the the, the woman who is uh, supposed to be running it uh, had a really, really good grasp on it and, and we had great talks. So um, it's Hollywood, so anything can happen still. And I know that everything is disrupted there. So, so I don't know, even have a, a good update to give right now, but uh, my tendency in these things is to say, I'm gonna give them all the help that I can and then say, this is their version, not mine. Uh, Joshua asks, uh, had read the book when it came out, but didn't find it until April, loved it, but didn't seem, but it didn't seem as fictional. How did you feel about that? Uh, yeah, it was, it was definitely weird, uh, having the future wasn't actually supposed to catch up with it. Uh, most, I think most people I know who write near future science fiction, um, at best, our hope that we're sort of writing warnings. Uh, it, it, it's not meant to be predictive at any point in the game. Like at best it's, it's like, do not go there. And, and to have everything fall in the ways that it did uh, was, was very strange. And um, especially hard for, uh, I, I left in the book, I left out a lot of the during. <laughs> there's a before and an after and there's not a lot of during. And um, during is really hard because, because uh, watching, watching my, my friends who are musicians struggle is really hard and watching the venue struggle and ask for help that they should be getting and they're not getting is really hard. Along with everything else. But. All right, um, so Sarah's going to read another piece of the novel. If, if folks have more questions, uh, put them in the chat and we'll, we'll come back to some questions uh, at the end. So. Yeah, this is, this is a shorter section. Um, and for those who haven't read it, uh, that other character was Luce, who's a musician. And um, that was the before. And Rosemary is uh, the other character. And she is a young woman who's grown up in the after. So, so a few years down the line, um, 
she works from home and she's been invited. Uh, she, she works for Super Wally, this big online company that, uh, that does a lot of, um, and uh, yeah, that does a lot of uh, uh, virtual stuff. Uh, and support on the back end of, of virtual stuff. So she's just been invited to her first virtual concert. She's never gotten to go to one before because her parents didn't believe in all the VR stuff. And that puts me... All right, so I'm just throwing us right into the concert. The dim overhead lights got even dimmer. The crowd cheered. Who were they cheering? It wasn't like the band could hear them. Rosemary hesitated, then joined in. It felt good to add her voice to a group. She'd never done that before. It left a pleasant vibration inside her. She'd done it in real space as well. She imagined what it must have been like in the old days when entire stadiums cheered together. The rig overhead whirred to life. Rosemary glanced up and was rewarded with a blinding flash. She looked back to where ghost gear now rested in what had been the empty space. A drum kit at the center, a couple of large amplifiers, three microphone stands, a rack full of ghost guitars. Somebody near the stage reached a hand out and chopped through a guitar neck. He disappeared a second later. There were penalties for disturbing the illusion. The lights flickered, and a moment later, musicians stood holding the instruments. The effect was eerie. The original empty stage must have been recording because there wasn't even a second's pause before they hit a chord. Out of nothing, music. Three voices and two guitars. They held the note for 10 seconds, then drums rolled over it. Rosemary had been to a wave pool once when she was five at a rundown amusement park in the before. She had waded out into the water holding her father's hand. The pool was crowded and flat, full of people lounging in tubes in the lull between wave sets. She spotted something on the bottom, a nickel or a quarter shining just beyond her reach, and released her father's hand to grab it. That was when the first wave hit, knocking her back toward the shallows. She surfaced lost and sputtering and terrified, but strangely exhilarated. The music hit Rosemary like a wave, knocking her breath from her, louder than anything she had ever heard, filling every corner of her. One chord and she was full. Don't stop, Rosemary thought. Don't ever stop. The song shifted, and she recognized it now. It was one of the ones she had checked out this evening before the show, but altered. The intro and the recorded version had been tamed, tempered. She thought it was okay, nothing special. She hadn't realized music could reach inside you. She pushed closer. Camera flashes went off throughout the room. The bag checker outside had said pictures were possible for the first two minutes, but she couldn't tear her attention away from the band long enough to even to blink a screenshot. What would it have captured anyway? Ghostly faces, a tinny recording. Nothing like the magnet in her gut drawing her toward the stage. The hollow quality changed, the second minute changed the girl had mentioned, a momentary shimmer. Rosemary pressed her avatar up against the people in front of her, the closest she had been to strangers in her entire adult life. The, the hoodie gave a warning jolt, but the other people didn't notice, or if they noticed, they didn't care. A gap opened between two men in front, and she pushed through, hoping there wasn't et etiquette against it. The space expanded before her, a highlighted path leading her to a better spot. She found herself in the front row and right of center, gazing up at the bassist, a tall, lean, shaven-headed woman with skin so brown the hologram, hologram pushed it into purple. She wore jeans and a sleeveless t-shirt showing off amazing biceps, and she was barefoot. She had a bruise under her left big toenail, which made her more real. Rosemary fought the urge to touch her. God, she fell in love easily, not that it ever led anywhere. Rosemary had always liked music, even if she didn't know much about it. She'd listen if somebody told her to listen to something, bought songs and posters of artists she enjoyed, but she'd never gone out seeking anything. She didn't know what was cool and what wasn't. She played this song, The Crash, after the hoodie arrived this evening, and had thought it was decent. Nothing like how it sounded now. Nothing had ever satisfied her the way writing code did, but now she was the code, and she was being overridden. The crash ended. Rosemary felt its absence as a physical loss. She placed her drink by her feet to clap, and a second later it disappeared. The lead singer stepped back to the mic. He shielded his eyes and peered out as if he saw them. The people in front of him hollered for attention he couldn't give them. Good to see you all. Good to be here at the Bloom Bar. His lips shimmered as he said the words Bloom Bar, as if they'd been inserted separately. A lock of hair fell in his eyes and he brushed it aside. We're going to go ahead and play some songs for you, yeah? The bassist opened her eyes for the first time. Something caught her attention, something whatever place she was actually in. 
She glanced down, shook her head, then looked straight at Rosemary and winked. It was the sexiest wink Rosemary had ever seen. She knew it hadn't been meant for her, but it might as well have been. She took a step forward before reminding herself she was an avatar looking at an avatar of someone standing in a warehouse somewhere where a hundred or a thousand or three thousand miles away, someone who had just winked at someone else. She refocused on the singer. Something shimmered above his head, and when she examined the link, she found a menu of optional enhancements and accessibility options. Subtitles, translation subtitles, vibration boost, visual description tags. Nothing she needed, but cool to know it was there. The next song began with the bass pulse. The basses closed her eyes again, and Rosemary stepped back, trying to regain her composure. She examined the stage. From here, she could read the, the song titles on the set list at the bass's feet, even though she didn't recognize any of them after the crash. Ghost sweat rolled off the drummer's face, and he wiped it with the ghost forearm. What would it be like to have a subscription and relive these shows any time she wanted? To capture this band and have them to herself? Go to more shows? Not for the first time. She wished she could do this every night. If Sport Hollow and TV Hollow were this real, too? That explained why her friends always looked at her with such pity when she said her family didn't go in for any of it. She'd been missing out on so much. Encores are awkward in this situation, the lead singer said after the 12th song. So we're going to pretend this was our last song, and we left the stage, and you stomped and cheered until we came out to play one more. We'll play one more, and then we're going to go for real. Thanks for listening. Don't go, Rosemary wanted to say. Keep playing. It didn't matter that she didn't know the songs. The music had stirred something inside her. The real last song ended with a long cymbal splash and four chunks of the guitar, which also wasn't the ending on any music she'd ever heard before. It had to be rehearsed, but it felt a little wild at the same time, a loose possibility that things might not work out as planned. The band members grinned at each other on the third chunk, and the bassist raised one lovely eyebrow as she watched the drummer. The last note hung in the air, the singer gave a final salute, and then the band blinked from existence. They were there, and then gone like magic, leaving a three-dimensional Stage Hollow Live logo floating in the place where they had stood. It was followed by a voice saying, Patent Madison merchandise is for sale here, as well as at Super Wally and Stage Hollow Live. Purchase now to wear instantly inside, or have the real thing drawn to you by the time you get home. A recording filled the room, flat in comparison with what had been there a moment before. The lights came on. The room was much smaller than it had seemed in the dark, or maybe that was an illusion too. The ceiling lower, the walls closer, the floor scuffed and littered with plastic cups, which winked away a moment later. Most of the audience had already headed for the exit or blinked out from where they stood, but a few people still lingered by the bar or stood blank and absent, probably buying patent medicine merchandise. A couple of t-shirts changed before her eyes. Rosemary understood the appeal. If there were a way to capture that first moment when the band had played the chord that had crashed into her, she'd buy it. A t-shirt wouldn't do that. Maybe maybe a live recording. If not, she'd have to find a way to see them again. Sarah, right, thanks so much. Those were great. Um, so again, folks, if you have any questions and want to put them in the chat, uh, any questions for Sarah or the book? Um, I, I'm trying to not like give away questions that, uh, that we were going to discuss in class tomorrow. <laughs> Everything I have is notes for the class. Um, since since you do have something that's sort of done and coming out next year, do you want to talk a little about um, about what's next uh, about We Are Satellites? Sure. Yeah. Uh, I, so my next novel is called We Are Satellites. It'll be out in May, and it is also a story with that uh, technology, like like you said, um, at the core. Uh, I think the question that I tend to to pose is is how does how does a given technology affect people at the like, uh, at the smallest level like not not the big how will it change the world but but I like to look at how how will it change an individual and so it's a, a story about one particular technology which is a brain implant and um, one particular family uh, which includes four people. Uh, one of whom wants the technology, one of whom needs the technology, one of whom can't have it, and one who uh, who chooses not to. 
and uh, and the ways that it affects them as a family uh, as it becomes more ubiquitous. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of questions. Um, what kind of music or instruments do you like to play? Uh, so my my instrument is guitar. Um, I think some of them are in the corner. Yeah, some of them are back there. <laughs> um, and I uh, I play. Uh, I guess like singer songwriter folk type stuff new folk and then I also have a rock band which plays the same songs louder and faster oh. um, so that was from Desmond uh, Courtney asks did you have a playlist or artist that you particularly listen to while writing the book um, well well there's the stuff that like I said is in the song titles and, and you can find that um, I made a playlist of it but I, I would have to find it. Um, but my dirty secret is actually, I can't listen to music when I write, um, not even a little bit. Uh, if, it's, it, um, if I'm in a coffee shop and there's music playing in the background, I can tolerate that, but I cannot deliberately put on music I know. Uh, it doesn't matter if it has lyrics, it doesn't matter if it's in another language. My, my brain just doesn't do well with letting music be background. I think um, there's an interview with, I think it's Rachel, Rachel Kushner, where somebody asked her the same question and she said, it's, it's the equivalent of asking if I would like to eat a really nice meal while playing tennis. <laughs> I like that, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, same, even, I, I sometimes, I keep seeing writers who are like, oh, here are soundtracks that I listen to and here's like, you know, like old Brian, you know, a ambient albums that I listen to and I try it and. Yeah, I can listen to music like, gearing myself up to write something like I was listening to lots of great like live recordings before I would write a music chapter but but I would I would have to like listen to a whole bunch of stuff and then and then send it away yeah and I my uh I have to say I write with a good friend when, when we're not in the middle of a pandemic I have a good friend who I meet at a coffee shop and we write together a lot um but he listens to one song on repeat while he writes one song over and over and over again. Um, and it's, yeah, I don't know how, but you know what song whatever. It is? Well, I mean, at, at the, the one that I'm remembering in particular was, was something off of the soundtrack for the new Ghostbusters. Um, it, it was the, the remake of the Ghostbusters theme because, because there was another couple in the room with us who at one point I heard whisper to each other, um, is, is that guy listening? to the Ghostbusters theme on repeat. So yeah, that's what it was, yeah. Okay. Uh, David asks, how long had you been thinking about this story before you started writing it? Uh, this one for a long time. I, I, I have an, a novelette uh, called Our, uh, Our Lady of the Open Road, which came out in 2015, which means I wrote it probably in 2014, I believe. Um, so the novel has been had been percolating for at least that long I knew that like that was a standalone and it wasn't intended to be like it isn't part of this story but it's it is about these characters or one of these characters um so I, I guess since 2014 and I guess I finished it in 2018 so if it come out in 2019 uh, Joshua asks, or Joshua says, I like the way you led the reader to wonder whether the terrorism was actually initiated by the government intended. How did you do this? I left some of, I, a lot, my question is what does the, what, which things do the characters know? And if the characters don't know something, then I leave it ambivalent. And if the characters care about something, then they'll look into that. And, and these particular characters were more concerned with how it affected them than, than with the actual cause. And so, so yeah, it is left rather ambivalent. Um, and I did want that question to be there. And I have I, uh, most of the questions like that that are ambivalent, I know the answer, but I try to leave them hazy uh, if, if they would be hazy to the characters. Yeah, I, th I think that speaks to what you're saying about um, about the next book too, is that like keeping that kind of focus. And when I was reading We Are Satellites, I, I was like, uh, 
are we going to move into this bigger story? And the fact that it stayed focused on, on really these four core characters was, I, I really enjoyed. Um, Mary asks, what's your writing routine? Do you write while touring? Uh, I haven't toured in a few years now, so so the answer, um, unless you mean book touring, in which case the answer is kind of no on that, because book tours tend to be short. Um, traditionally, on music tours, I'd never, uh, no, actually, that's not true. I did write some music while on music tours, because you're usually in this kind of music-y space, so as long as you have a little bit of so I did write on, I wrote music on music tours, but I did not write fiction on music tours. Um, that, and, oh, and writing, I was trying to remember what the first half was, uh, the, the writing routine question. Um, I would like to say that I have one right now. I do not have a great routine right now. Um, my routine used to be to go to the coffee shop that I like because, um, they, I, I was, I was such a regular there that they let me like behind, I would go get my own water and my own coffee and everything. Um, like I just, like, I was sort of part of the furniture and um, it was a place where, where I could pretend that there was no internet, which worked very well for me. Um, being at home now all the time, I am still trying to set my routines and I set them and then I break them. It usually involves walking the dog early in the morning and then uh, sitting down and writing, uh, but that's kind of a lie because a lot of days I don't. Um, I have a new book I'm working on that I'm excited about, which uh, hopefully is going to get me writing more again. I, uh, I was stuck for a lot of this year doing edits and uh, stories that I owed for different projects that I had promised, um, some of which I was excited about and some of which I was distracted about. So. Um, and I did a lot of election stuff. So, um, so yeah, it's been a, it's been a year as we all know. This was a good, this felt like a good year to have editing available as something one could do. Yeah. Editing and teaching both. I was, I was glad to be doing both of those things instead of trying to actually work on a novel for most of this. That actually segues nicely into Joanne's question. A Wells professor back in the day told us all the time that writing is rewriting. Do you actually rewrite endlessly or just think a lot and then occasionally bang it all out? Uh, I do go back to stuff, especially what, when I'm trying to figure something out. Um, if, if, I, if I'm in a big hurry, then, then I try to get through a first draft without too much um, editing. Uh, I can do that with short stories, especially uh, I sometimes, I've started writing some short stories longhand um, where I can't actually force myself to edit because I really have trouble reading my own handwriting. And so, so I can just leave it all behind until I get to the end and then, and then do the editing. Um, I do tend to reread what I did the previous day and start tweaking stuff. Um, but part of that, and I guess this could go back to writing routine also, um, a lot of my writing is done in my head while I walk the dog and while I run. Um, I, if I'm sitting in front of a blank screen, I like, I tap like three words and then I get distracted and then I, you know, check Twitter again and then like, it doesn't work. But if I think while I'm walking or running and I get excited about something, then I come back and that's what I need to get onto the page. And it's all there in my head and I just need to transcribe it. And that's when it feels like it's actually flowing and I don't need to go checking things. And then usually I'll sleep on that or go for another walk and remember what I need to tweak. And so the next time in, I might go and add a sentence or two or um, realize what I had needed to fix. Um, why don't we take one more question? Uh, um, uh, you mentioned a friend who you write with or used to is being part of a writing community an important part of your practice. Yes, I've been fortunate to have uh, to be welcomed into a wonderful writing community. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's overlapping uh, literary and science fiction circles in Baltimore. And, and uh, I, I haven't found that, that either one looks down on the other, which is great. Um, so so um, there's always been a lot of, uh, there are good reading series and, uh, great bookstores and uh, there's a public critique group and um, 
yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm lucky to have that. And there's a lot of great writers in this city right now. Great. Um, I want to uh, thank you for, for joining us and for the reading. I want to thank everyone who is here. Um, and uh, some of us who are here will see you again tomorrow for class. And I think with that, Dan, should I hand it back to you? Yeah, I can, I can, over there. Yeah, I can just uh, wrap us up quickly to say, um, to echo your thanks. Um, uh, I'll also announce that in the spring, we'll have another great virtual series lined up for everybody. Um, we have incredible poets like Shane McRae and Lauren Shapiro coming, as well as Ed Pavlich, who's written outstanding books of poetry, fiction, and nonfiction, and Diane Cook, whose novel was shortlisted for this year's Booker Prize. Um, so it's a seller lineup that's already confirmed, and there are one or two more luminaries who we have sort of in talks, I don't wanna announce them until we've sort of firmed those talks up, but stay tuned. And thank you all again for joining us tonight. Thanks Bob for the hosting duties and all the work that you've done behind the scenes. Um, thank you so much, Sarah, for sharing your work. It's such a treat to hear it. Um, and good night, everyone. Thanks again, take care and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you all for being here. Have a good night.